Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. And welcome to Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. Glad to have you with us. Uh, join me uh, by phone and uh, some video, well, not video, uh, picture today is going to be Dr. Aswath Rahman. Uh, Aswath is joining me again. He had been on the show a few years ago with the most amazing uh, discovery I, I thought at the time that I had ever heard of. Uh, Dr. Rahman is a professor, assistant professor at University of Pennsylvania, also the co-founder and chief science officer of a group called SkyCool Systems, and we'll see what SkyCool is all about. Uh, welcome, Aswath. Uh, thanks. Uh, happy to be here again. Excellent. Excellent. Um, so, Aswath's background, or why, why, don't you, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and how, how you got started in this whole, this whole business? Sure. Um, well, I, <clears throat> academically at least, uh, I became very concerned about <clears throat> climate change and the energy challenge that we were all facing about a decade ago now, and I uh, decided to go get a PhD. And uh, I did my graduate school uh, in applied physics at Stanford, uh, which is on the west coast of the U.S., uh, with a particular focus on thinking about uh, the question of how we can better, better make use of light and heat, um, and that was sort of my entry point into this whole topic area. The, the research area I actually pursued is a, a topic known as nanoscale photonics or optics, um, but simply it's the idea that we can make things with features on very small length scales, so much smaller than a human hair or the wavelength of light itself. Uh, and in doing so, we can induce some very unusual interactions between these artificial materials and uh, light, and it turns out heat as well. So that was kind of my entry point into all of this, uh, you know, in, in a larger sense. Right, and it was amazing what he, what he has come up with. Uh, it, it almost seems like a violation of the laws of physics, although, of course, it isn't. Uh, but the idea is that he, uh, Oswald has developed a surface that is highly reflective, but in a very limited band. And uh, Oswald recently did a nice TED Talk and explains this extremely well on a TED Talk. It's well, well worth watching for anyone who wants to see this. Uh, but basically, just as we all, anything that is visible is reflecting light, uh, everything reflects light and reflects heat too. And Oswath cleverly manipulated matter to have that reflection, to, just as we can paint something a different color and it looks different, he uh, painted, as it were, a surface uh, with a structured substance such that it reflects light out in a very narrow band of, I believe, the near infrared that our atmosphere is very, very transparent to, right? So none of this comes back in, right? Yeah, and uh, so we can actually see that in the first slide I have. So if you'd, if you'd be able to pull that up, it's uh, uh, it's actually in a part of the spectrum that's known as the mid or far infrared. Oh, okay. Uh, and to yeah, to to really understand this, you know, maybe just kind of stepping back, uh, all objects, including you and I, and the walls around us, and the buildings, the Earth itself. Uh, we all radiate heat uh, as a kind of light that we can't see. Uh, this is a concept known as black body radiation or a thermal radiation. So, uh, uh, you know, every object kind of naturally does this to some extent. Now, what's interesting about our atmosphere is that if you were a surface pointing yourself up towards the sky, uh, you would send up some of this this heat as infrared light because you naturally do that because you're at a certain temperature. It's kind of a basic physical law. Uh, however, some of that heat escapes, as you pointed out, and we can see that in this slide because uh, in, in what we plotted is what's called a transmission window. Um, this transmission window uh, effectively allows some of that heat to escape, and it's between 8 and 13 microns in wavelength. So this is a much longer wavelength than visible light, the light that we can see. Um, now, what's very, what makes all of this very exciting and interesting 
is that what's outside the atmosphere, so what this transmission window leads us to, uh, is space. And if you go to the next slide, uh, you'll see that the, the fundamentally enabling uh, component of the technology I'll, I'll describe is the fact that what's outside our atmosphere is very cold. This and is minus 270 degrees. Out some of the, yeah, at minus 270 degrees Celsius or minus 454 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's you know a very, very cold temperature. It's the ultimate cold sink. It's the ultimate place to send heat. But what people don't realize is that we can actually access this in some way. Um, and it's as simple as literally just stepping outside and pointing yourself up towards the sky. So, you know, if you, as an individual, were to step outside right now, uh, the top of your head is actually radiating some of its heat to space. Um, and that's just, you know, something that naturally happens all the time. Right, but the difference is, at the same time, during the day, of course, sunlight is pouring energy down onto the top of your head, right? And it counterbalances it. Right. Exactly, and the, this concept, you know, because of that, you know, people used to call this concept night sky cooling, meaning you would only observe it at night uh, when the sun isn't there. So uh, if you, you know, and this happens naturally, uh, especially on clear nights. So if you were to go and measure the temperature of your roof um, at night for some reason, uh, you would see that it's actually below the air temperature uh, because of this effect. Uh -huh. Now, during the day, as, as you rightly point out, during the day, the complication is that the sun usually completely overwhelms this cooling effect so that, you know, people had traditionally thought that it was not a useful uh, idea during the day. And technologically, this is, of course, problematic because during the day is when we need something coldest uh, the most. Right, and this is really not, it's not brand new science. You, you describe in that uh, TED talk that you do that uh, some of the folks in the Middle East in ancient times would actually put out shallow pools of water on clear nights and actually be able to harvest ice from that. Yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of remarkable. It's, um, uh, you know, before the advent of modern ice-making machines, uh, people used to have these dedicated facilities or buildings just to make ice. Uh, in northern parts of our world, uh, these ice houses uh, usually would involve uh, just getting natural ice that formed in the winter and storing it through the summer months. Uh, now, in many parts of the Middle East, uh, it rarely actually got below freezing. Right. But they were actually able to take advantage of this effect to make ice, usually during the winter still, um, at night. And, and the way they did it, as you described, is you'd have these shallow pools of water, uh, and you would basically pour the water out as the sun set. Uh, and at night, you would actually, the, that water would freeze. Um, and uh, in the early morning hours, the people who would run these facilities would collect the ice, chop it up into pieces, and then store it in, kind of underground in these facilities that would stay relatively cool all the way into the summer months. So you could, you know, have ice cream in the, in the summer. <laughs> Ancient, in ancient Persia. So uh, people were pretty ingenious. And, you know, I have to emphasize, it's very unlikely the folks that were building these necessarily understood the, the science behind it, but they understood the effect. They, they saw it happen. Right. Uh, someone observed it naturally happening and said, hey, why don't we, you know, I see frost form on the ground. Why, why don't we use this to make a lot more ice in a more systematic way? Yeah, and it's, I, I love the story also that you told uh, building your first nanostructured surface and putting it out on the roof of a building in Stanford. Uh, you talk about that in that in that TED talk, and realizing when you when you touched it after it had been out there for a while that it was cooler than the surrounding air. Exactly. So the you know when when I started working on this, it was around 2012 or 2013, and the the, the whole idea was that, well, I had actually kind of started from a basic question, which was why, you know, why wasn't this actually being used as a technology? Like what, what was the fundamental kind of scientific roadblock here? Um, and one thing I realized was an issue immediately was that it didn't work during the day. And so that, that kind of led to the advent of this whole project. 
And uh, we eventually came up with a design of an artificial material or structure um, that we could use conventional technologies that already exist to actually deposit and fabricate. And the, the funny thing about this kind of lab experiment is that you can't actually do it in a lab. You actually have to go outside and you know face the sky to see if it's actually doing what it's supposed to do. So these kinds of experiments are pretty funny because you basically go on a rooftop somewhere um, and you, you know, put your material out there to face the sky and then you see what its temperature is. So that, that very first time, you know, I, I, I was, it was the first time I was actually running the experiment, so I wasn't sure it was actually going to work. I figured there'd be some problem or thing I hadn't thought about. Uh, but amazingly enough, the, you know, I just left it for half an hour. I came back up on the roof. Uh, and you're, as a scientist, you're probably not supposed to do this, but I decided to just touch it. <laughs> and uh, it was, you know, very cold to the touch immediately, and I figured, hey, this is probably working. So uh, that was pretty exciting. It was probably one of the best, you know, research moments I've ever had in my career. Yeah, uh, I mean, because, because that, does, that just does seem up to break in a common sense sense. Uh, sense. Uh, basic yeah, it's, it's, everything it's, it's, that sits in the sun gets warm. I mean, we know this from our common experience. There is nothing that gets right. cold when it sits in the sun, right? Yeah, so it was it was really counterintuitive, and yeah. you know, I, I would do this I would do this demo for people where I would essentially, you know, shade it, uh, and you would think, hey, it'll it'll get cooler, but it would actually start warming up. <laughs> right again, uh, so, yeah. counterintuitive, amazing. Yeah, and. Yeah, and it's it's one way to think about what we did was we essentially it's like we took the sun out of the picture, and it was like we were basically returning to what would happen at night because we were reflecting almost all the sun's incident energy, um, so we avoided getting heated up by the sun. So that that was kind of the you know the the moment of insight and the the, the kind of the thing I think that. We, we thought made this technology really compelling because now we had a, something that got cold below the air temperature uh, throughout the day. And there's very few things out there like that. Uh, this is utterly amazing technology indeed. Uh, Oswath, we're gonna have to take a short break here, one minute break. Uh, and for our viewers out there, I'm Ethan Allen, host of, uh, of Likeable Science here on Think Tech. Uh, my guest is Dr. Oswath Rahman from the University of Pennsylvania and SkyCool Systems, and we'll be back in one minute. Are you tired of sleepwalking through life? Are you dreaming of a healthier, wealthier, happier you? You're not alone, and that's why thousands of people tune in each week to watch R.B. Kelly on Out of the Comfort Zone, Tuesdays at 1 p.m. Make a change, get the help you need, and stop sucking at life. The Army, we're about to go live. Oh. Hello, it's 1 p.m. on a Tuesday afternoon, and I'm your host, R.B. Kelly. Welcome to Out of the Comfort Zone. Aloha, my name is Reg Baker, and I'm the host of Business in Hawaii. We broadcast every Thursday from 2 to 2.30, and we highlight successful businesses in Hawaii. Hawaii has some challenges. Most places do. But we have businesses here that have figured out how to make it work, and we learn their secrets, and we learn how they have made it successfully in Hawaii. Occasionally, we'll have organizations that come on and explain how they help these businesses to be successful. Uh, and we find that there's an awful lot of resources out there available to anybody in business to help them do better. So please tune in every Thursday from 2 to 2.30 here at the Think Tech Studios and get educated. Aloha. And you're back here on Think Tech Hawaii, another episode of A Likeable Science with your host, me, Ethan Allen. And my guest joining us from the University of Pennsylvania today is Dr. Aswath Rahman, who has developed this utterly astounding coating or material that reflects so much of the incoming radiation from the sun that it actually gets cooler than the surrounding air when it sits in the sun. And uh, we, we want to now look a little more deeply into sort of how it does this, why it does this, but even more importantly, where does this lead us, Oswath? Where, do, where are we going to go with this? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's, it's actually something we thought a lot about uh, many years ago as well. 
um, especially once you know we, we got it to work. Um, I think there's there, there are a few kind of interesting observations. Uh, you know, just thinking about it from the, the technological perspective, what are what is this technology strength? Well, um, it works 24 hours a day. It can get passively cooler than the air temperature, uh, and it doesn't require any water, so it's it's non-evaporative. Um, and you know, if, to the extent that people care about this, it's it's uh, it's also silent, so it's it's not a noisy machine. It just is just sits there and it gets cold. Um, when we when we saw the kind of the advantages of the technology, we, we started thinking about how we might actually use it to tackle the specific problem of air conditioning and refrigeration. And that became the focus of a lot of our efforts. Right, because you point out that uh, air conditioning and refrigeration systems it, it involve a huge amount of energy expenditure from our country and from the world around us. Something like 15, 18 percent of the energy current, that we currently use is goes into cooling things. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's around that, and uh, I guess uh, specifically it's electricity, I think, maybe not energy in okay. total, uh, but uh, globally, yeah, it's, it's about that. It's, uh, and, and I think what's, what's kind of scary about it is that our energy use for cooling is expected to grow about sixfold uh, by wow. the year 2050, which is, which is only about 30, 32 years away, so it's not that far away. Um, and you know, most, most of this growth right now is um, – not coming from you know Western uh, industrialized countries, but it's uh, really coming from Asia and and in many African countries as well. Um, you know, I think it, it, a lot of the a lot of uh, equatorial countries and um, countries in East Asia uh, get very warm in the summer. Folks want to have the benefits of air conditioning and certainly refrigeration for you know their food system. Uh, so it's completely understandable that this kind of this is like one of the first uh, technologies that someone uh, arriving in the middle class wants to purchase. Um, now the problem from a kind of system level, however, is that right now these systems contribute to about 10 percent of global greenhouse gas emissions. Right. And if this trend goes, uh, that that's a that's a big increase in greenhouse gases. Um, and some people have pointed out that it. If our planet gets warmer, which is widely expected to get um, and has been getting, uh, you know, uh, the, the warmer it gets, the more we're going to run those air conditioners and the more they're going to put greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. So there's this nasty feedback loop that we might uh, initiate, and perhaps we've already initiated it. Right. It, it, you can just sort of see it gets hotter, you need more air conditioning, you're running more air conditioning, you're dumping more, you're using more fuel, you're dumping more greenhouse gases out, and you're on a, on a vicious cycle right away. And so this technology that you have developed has the capacity to cut into that on sort of several different ways, right? Yeah, I think there's there's a lot of different potential ways we can we can tackle the problem. Uh, we realized that one of the most important things uh, that we needed to do first was figure out how we could couple this to today's air conditioning refrigeration systems. Uh, in, in the long run, there may be ways of designing buildings to really take advantage of these kinds of materials that we're making. Um, however, in the short run, you know, we have a large amount of cooling systems that exist already, uh, and uh, and it's, it's not likely that there's going to be a dramatic shift in how we use these systems within the next 10 or 15 years. So we, we wanted to be able to tackle the problem that exists today and right away. Right. The strategy we went about uh, is to actually build what we call fluid cooling panels using our materials. And if you go to the next slide, uh, you'll actually see some pictures of these panels uh, in operation at a, in a field, uh, field trial in Davis, California. Okay. So these panels, uh, essentially you should think of them as being analogous to solar water heaters. Uh, flat plate kind of solar water heaters, not the evacuated tube variety, if you're familiar with the, the different kinds. Uh, however, we use our specialized films uh, to cool the water instead of heat it up. So these are so solar that's what water you're actually coolers. seeing in the picture. <laughs> exactly. So, you, so you, you essentially have a, a sky water cooler, if you want to think about it that way. Um, uh, I mean, just to emphasize, we're not using the sun at all. We're, the sun is actually a bad thing. We're typically, actually, we're typically tilting our panels slightly to the north, uh, away from the sun. Um, 
the so the the really remarkable thing about this that you know we they, they, that we realized was that um, um, is that um, we could actually uh, scale the film pretty quickly using existing processes, manufacturing processes, um, and that we were able to kind of rapidly go from something that was very in the lab scale to the prototype products you see right there uh, with our startup SkyCool systems. And the, 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 the panels you see there, for example, are about three by six feet in size, so they're fairly large, and that means they can actually reject uh, a meaningful amount of heat. Right, so then you, now you've got this cool water, which you can then use in any sort of a cooling system, right? Right, so you've now got essentially you know, a, a closed loop way of rejecting heat and keeping something colder than the air temperature. And that makes it entirely unique in the space of existing cooling technology. So it's been, it's a very kind of compelling uh, ability that this technology has. We think the most direct way to use it is as an add-on uh, to today's uh, HVAC and refrigeration systems. So uh, the, I think uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the main way to, I, I think, uh, uh, think about this is that uh, the, there's a component that every cooling system has, which is called a condenser. Right. Um, and if you, if you uh, the, the basic idea in a cooling system is that you're actually taking away heat from somewhere else. Uh, heat flows from hot to cold. Right. So in a cooling system, uh, you're, there's an inside part, which is called an evaporator, uh, which draws the heat in. The heat is then, uh, uh, and there's a refrigerant, which is then compressed uh, and then taken up to a higher pressure, uh, which then allows us to reject that heat outside. Um, now, typically, this condenser, to be able to reject its heat to its ambient environment, uh, needs to sit at you know 10, 20, even 30 degrees Fahrenheit above the air temperature to be able to efficiently get that heat out. Our panels connect in on that side to keep that condenser at a lower temperature. And what that means is then that the compressor has to do less work. It uses less electricity to deliver the same amount of cooling uh, for the person who's sitting inside. Ah, okay, okay, I see. So you're, you're, you've got sort of an assistive device then for existing air conditioning systems, right? Yeah, and I think the, the, it's perhaps one way to think about this is this is probably the way to immediately get this idea um, into its most widely applicable use case and to really tackle the, the largest variety of systems that exist today. So this applies for everything from, you know, your split air conditioning unit at home, uh, window air conditioning units potentially as well, though they're a little, uh, you know, they're compact, so it's a little difficult to modify them sometimes. Um, all the way up to the commercial and industrial scale. So the cooling systems that are used in data centers, uh, in supermarkets, and cold storage warehouses, these re industrial scale systems, they all work under essentially the same principle. So any of these systems can have an efficiency boost uh, with our panels uh, and interfacing with them uh, as an add-on. So, uh, you know, though you don't have to completely change your system, we can just serve as this efficiency boost. And what's remarkable is that efficiency boost can be 10, even 20%. And for folks that work in this industry, that's a huge number. Sure. We, we often face a, a lot of skepticism when you say something like 10 or 20% because, you know, usually, for, there's not many technologies, if any, that can deliver that kind of uh, that boost. So there's, uh, I think, there's been a tremendous amount of interest we've seen from people across the whole kind of spectrum of use cases of cooling systems. Right, and then the nice thing that is, that gets your technology out into a broader public. And more people will become aware of it, right, and will understand that there is this sort of odd exception to, to the universal rule that everything that sits in the sun warms up, right? It's everything that sits in the sun except for the sky cool systems <laughs> warms up. Uh, and then you can really begin to play with that system in other ways, right, potentially. Yeah, uh, definitely. I think there's uh, there's a lot of potential directions you can take it from there. You know, there there have been uh, third party studies that have been done by uh, national labs in the United States, which have showed that if you use panels like ours in conjunction with higher efficiency 
uh, internal cooling systems inside a building, uh, uh, you can actually boost the uh, efficiency, or a better, a better phrase, you can reduce the electricity use uh, for air conditioning, in particular, in a commercial office building, by two thirds. So that's that's a huge number on an on an annual basis. Yeah. Uh, uh, now, the trick there is that it's not only our system, but you also want to take advantage of a lot of other efficiency technologies that have uh, come uh, into the market in the last few decades. And uh, you know, th this particular scenario, we would pair our panels uh, with indoor radiant ceiling panels. So these are. You can think of them as sort of the indoor version of what we're doing, uh, where instead of radiating the heat to the sky, you're drawing the heat from the people and objects inside the room uh, to a ceiling tile where there's uh, essentially water flowing through it. Uh, and that water can then be pumped directly to our panels, which then cool it back down and recirculate it back into the system. So that's, you know, th that's a, 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 a it's actually a well-understood technology. It's been around for decades. Uh, it doesn't have a huge amount of market penetration in the U.S. yet, but it's increasingly finding its way into a lot of high-efficiency buildings. So there's a, uh, a really neat opportunity for us to pair with these kinds of panels to perhaps go entirely passive, so zero electricity. Right. This is a, the, the beauty of this whole thing is that ultimate sort of here it is, zero, zero power a, AC, basically, and, and suddenly yeah, you, don't, you don't need to be burning fossil fuel, contributing to greenhouse gases. You're getting air conditioning for free from the sun, right? <laughs> uh, from the sky. Just from the sky, <laughs> right, sorry, right. And so- Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, go ahead. I was just gonna wrap this up here by, by saying, what you've done is really taking, you're taking advantage of this tremendous temperature difference between the warm surface of the Earth and the utter cold in the depth of space and you are channeling heat very efficiently away from the Earth into that in, sort of infinite cold sink, right? Yeah, exactly. And uh, I just wanted to mention, if you go to that very last slide, uh, you can actually see the full deployment we had in Davis last summer, uh, where we actually hooked up our panels both with commercial-scale refrigeration systems as well as air conditioners. Mm -hmm. Uh, where we were, that's where we were demonstrating the 10 to 15 percent efficiency improvements that I mentioned. Um, yeah. So you know, uh, that that's just a plug to say that uh, this is this isn't just kind of a pie in the sky idea. It's uh, it's you know something we've managed to reduce to something that's uh, is pretty much a product and ready to test out in the market. Um, and yes, the ultimate way this is enabled is that we're taking advantage of the fact that what's outside our atmosphere is space and it's very cold. Uh, this is this is amazing. This is to, to me, it's it's sort of mind-boggling that you've done been able to do this and, and that you've taken it here just a relatively few years ago from when I first spoke with you to now and scaled this up, gotten out into a commercial format that's practical, that's being applied. I congratulate you for that. I'm 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 in awe of your of your capacities and your abilities to do that. And I look forward to getting you back here maybe in another two or three years and, and seeing what's what you've done with it after that. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, the thing that excites me the most is that uh, as much uh, as, you know, we're, this technology is going out there uh, now into the marketplace, there's a there's just a lot more science here as well. There's so little we understand at this point about how to really leverage this phenomenon, what its limits are, and what its other use cases might be. There might be opportunities for water conservation, power generation that we don't quite understand. So I think there's, on both fronts, uh, a lot of exciting things to come. Excellent. Well, well thank you so much, uh, Dr. Aswath Rahman from University of Pennsylvania and Sky Cola Systems, who's our guest today on ThinkTech. And I hope you'll come back next week and join us again. Till then.